Welcome to this Sunday morning broadcast of Marvin Methodist Church in downtown Tyler, Texas. My name is Doug Baker, and I'm the lead pastor. Today, we continue the sermon series entitled Convinced, Being Certain of What God Has Done in Christ. In a cynical world where we can at times become disillusioned or disoriented in our faith, the gospel writer Luke writes his gospel in such a way that we'll be convinced that Jesus is the Christ. You might notice that we are meeting for worship in a different location while updates and modifications are being made to our historic sanctuary in preparation for our new pipe organ coming in 2025. These are exciting times in Marvin's history. Thanks again for joining us. Let's join in as the sermon is underway. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Will you please join me in prayer? Most gracious God, we give you so much thanks for this time that we get to gather and lift your name on high and to worship you, Lord. And God, now as I preach, Lord, I ask that you hide me behind the cross. Lord, I ask that the words that come out of my mouth not be my own words, God, but they be directly from you, glorifying you, Lord Jesus, give us all open ears, open hearts to receive what it is that you're speaking to all of us, even to me, as I bring your word to us today. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. So last week, Dr. Baker preached on Jesus' very challenging command to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, to bless those who curse us and pray for those who mistreat us. And then continuing in Luke, Jesus then teaches what loving our enemy looks like and then tells us to be merciful just as our heavenly Father is merciful. And then our passage of scripture today is the continuation of Jesus' teaching and he explains what being merciful looks like. Now, I can't speak for other cultures, but I know from personal experience that here in America, the phrase, do not judge, is all too often ripped from its original context throughout Scripture and is applied in ways that are completely contradictory to the biblical intention. When someone's questionable or potentially harmful habits, their lifestyle, or their personal choices are brought up and observed as being sinful, a very common response is, well, the Bible says not to judge, only God can judge me. But then the person leaves the conversation unchanged with no conviction as they continue to live the same exact way with no care or concern that God actually is gonna judge all of us. And I know this because there was a time in my life that I unfortunately lived that way. I even had a shirt that I wore all the time and it had in big green letters on the front, don't you judge me. And if you scroll back far enough in my Facebook pictures, you'll be able to see a goofy picture of me wearing it. But that's beside the point. Our passage of scripture today opens up with the command, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. 
To judge means expressing an opinion or decision concerning right and wrong. And then to condemn means to find or pronounce someone guilty with the assumption that some type of vengeance or punishment is due. And if this sounds pretty harsh, it should. And I think that's why we see so much of this mentality of, you can't judge me, only God can judge me. And what backs this mentality up is other verses that speak on not judging others. So in scripture, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motive of men's hearts. And then in Romans chapter 14, verse 4 and 13, Paul says, Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And then he continues in verse 13, Therefore let us stop judging one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. And then we see in James chapter 4, verse 12, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, these verses make it seem pretty clear to me that we are not called to judge. But what happens when we just continue reading in our passage of Scripture today? We see at the very end, it closes with, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And so here it sounds kind of like we're actually called to judge, but with the stipulation that we first recognize our own sinful ways and remove them from our lives. Doing so prevents us from being the blind, leading the blind. And then we can also find other verses that say we are to judge. So we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is addressing this issue of this man who is in the congregation fully a part of it, but he's living in unrepentant sin. And they're also celebrating it to an extent. And so Paul writes to the Corinthian church, and he says in verse 3, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. And then we see in verses 12 and 13, Paul asks some rhetorical questions. He says, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. And then he quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. He says, expel the wicked person from among you. And then we have a couple of commands from Jesus. One found in John chapter 7, verse 24, where he says, stop judging by outward appearances and start judging justly. The other is from Luke chapter 12, verse 57. And why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? So then we're kind of seeing these two conflicting areas of what judgment means. So what is biblical judgment? How are we supposed to live into this? This is why it is so important to understand that we should not be cherry-picking Bible verses because when we do, we pull them out of their original context and then we lose the true meaning of what that Bible verse says. And so, Scripture tells us to not condemn and make final judgment against another person because that type of judgment belongs to Jesus Christ alone. We're also taught we should not apply a standard of judgment to others that we ourselves would not want applied to us. 
And we can see from the second list of verses that Scripture does teach us to judge whether a moral choice that confronts us is good or bad. And this is the type of judgment we are expected to make all the time. Is this choice that I'm about to make, is this reflecting Christ to others? Is this leading me deeper into relationship with Jesus? Or do I judge that this choice I'm about to make is reflecting sin to others? Is it leading others and myself away from relationship with Jesus Christ? And this type of judgment, it isn't just for ourselves, but it does extend to our brothers and sisters in the Christian faith. And so even though scripture tells us to have and exercise good moral judgment for ourselves and others who seek to follow Christ, the sole intention of this judgment is not for us to tear each other down. It's not for us to tear ourselves down. But this judgment is to build each other up in the love of Jesus Christ. It's for us to call ourselves to, to step into sanctification by the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And we get to ask others to come alongside us, not push them away. And so, like how Jesus says in verse 40 of our passage today, the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. And so when we make Jesus our teacher and become more like him through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that's when we learn to love, to pray for, to forgive, and to even bless not just our brothers and sisters in Christ, but our enemies as well. We will understand what it means to be merciful because we know exactly how merciful the Father has been to us when we were just caught up in sin and not knowing the truth of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to be very clear that the takeaway from this passage is not to, that we get a free license to just go and yell at others for how sinful they are and how terrible of a person they are. By no means is this the message that we are receiving today. What we need to take away from this is that we need to let ourselves be fully examined so that this giant, wrong, evil, and sinful log that's in our own eye can be removed before we even think about lovingly and mercifully calling our brothers and sisters in Christ to come alongside us in the journey of the Christian faith that Jesus has laid out for us. So over the summer, our young adult Sunday school class has asked to shake things up a little bit and instead of going picking one book of the Bible and just going one chapter at a time for each lesson, they, they wanted to do topics uh, for our Bible study lessons. And so just a few weeks ago, we had the topic of prayer. And I had done a lot of good study and received a lot of awesome things from it. And I just want to apologize to all of you because I can't remember who I'm about to quote. And so I went back through the different audio books and the different books that I had read and studied, and I just could not find where I found this idea from. So please forgive me. It's probably from C.S. Lewis or A.W. Tozer or some other author. But a section of one of the books really talked about the Lord's Prayer and how we are told by Jesus we are commanded by Jesus to pray this way. Give us this day our daily bread. And so the author expanded on the implications and the application of this specific part of the prayer, saying that this is not only a simple reminder that we are to solely depend on God for all of our needs. There's a little bit more to it than that. 
Bread was a powerful symbol of God's provision for his people in the Old Testament. Do y'all remember how God cared for the Israelites when they were in the wilderness after their exodus from Egypt? Life in the wilderness was hard, and soon the people began to complain that it would be better to be back in Egypt. And even worse, they said it would have been better to die in Egypt because at least they had plenty of food to eat there. And so in response to these complaints, God promised to provide and make bread rain down from heaven. And if that's all that Jesus implied when commanding us to pray this way, that would be sufficient and such an amazing prayer of just recognizing our need to rely on God's provision. But there's even more beauty and comfort to be found in these few short words of the prayer. Thinking back to God's provision found in Exodus, God rained down nourishment every single day of the week for his people's needs except for the Sabbath. But God made sure that they knew to gather enough the day before so that they could truly rest and be fed. God provides every day for his people, and our command to pray, give us this day our daily bread, also shows that God seeks to ease any of our anxieties, any of our stresses that we get when we think about next year, when we start making plans for next month, next week, and especially tomorrow. This prayer is a beautiful reminder to take a step back and to release our death grip that we have on our worries, on our stresses, and our anxieties. And with these open hands, we can receive what God is already handing to us, his provision for us today, right here, right now. And so the author of the audio book talked about how he had this friend that applied this exact mentality to his prayers over his wife fighting with cancer. As we all know, either from personal experience or having a loved one fight this horrible battle, it's so unexpected, even if it's caught in the early stages. We don't know what's gonna happen doctor visit to doctor visit, let alone day after day. And so this author's friend leaned on God's provision in such a powerful way by deciding to no longer pray aimlessly for overall healing for his wife, but instead he started to pray each day for God to provide the healing, the comfort, and the strength needed for his wife for that specific day much like how God provided the manna, that bread from heaven, that would only last for the specific days that it fell. But this was so that the Israelites would learn what it means to truly trust in God's provision each day. And we too can apply this way of intentional prayer to all the areas of our lives where we need God's provision especially when it comes to our passage of Scripture today. How can we expect to follow the command to be merciful as our Heavenly Father is merciful if we neglect to receive God's provision for that day? Day in and day out, if we are not remaining in relationship with the Lord, if we are not relying on or even receiving God's freely given grace and the guidance of His Holy Spirit each day, If that is not where our trust is in, if that is not where we are leaning, putting our full lives into, that's when we can become worn down to the point of falling into temptation and we start to reflect, not God, but we start to reflect the sinful world around us. And that reflection looks a lot like judging and condemning others while not letting them hold us accountable for the sins that we continue to do. 
It looks like not forgiving others while still expecting others to forgive us. And it looks like not giving to others what God has freely given us. Instead, God calls us to reflect him and his mercies that are new each day. He calls us to reflect the most holy and loving God who made us in his image and dwells in the hearts of all those who claim the name of Jesus Christ as Lord. The reality is that we do not have sufficient discernment or strength to do any of this on our own. But it's because the Holy Spirit lives and dwells in us that we are able to receive God's provision each day to live mercifully, not reflecting sin, but reflecting our almighty God who created us in his glorious image. Would y'all please pray with me? Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, guide us in thought, word, and deed to be merciful just as you are merciful. God, help us to not try to take the speck out of our neighbor's eye before we first let you examine us and help us remove the plank out of our own eye. God, we want to see with your loving vision that is not clouded by our own sin. God, help us to be merciful by not casting a stone at our neighbor for the speck in their eye, but instead, help us to show them your love as we help point them to the work and teachings of Jesus Christ that leads to your forgiveness, your redemption, your healing, and your transformation. We ask this for the glory of the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Show me thy face, one transit gleam of loveliness divine. And I shall never think or dream Of other love save thine All lesser light will darken quite All lower glories fade The beautiful of earth will scarce Seem beautiful again Show me thy face, my faith and love will henceforth fix me and nothing here have power to move my soul serenity my life shall seem a trance a dream and all i see or feel elusive visionary thou the one reality show me thy face i shall forget the weary days before the fretting ghost of vain regret shall haunt my soul no more all the doubts and fears of future years in quiet trust subside and naught but bless content and calm within my breast abide Show me thy face, I shall forget The weary days before The fretting ghost of vain regret Shall haunt my soul no more All the doubts and fears of future years In quiet trust subside And naught but bless, content and calm 
within my soul abide. Show me thy face, the heaviest cross will then seem light to bear. There will be gain in every loss, and peace with every care. With such light feet the years will flee, life seems as brief as blessed. So I have laid my burdens down, and entered into rest. With such light feet the years will flee Life seems as brief as blessed Till I have laid my burdens down And entered into rest Till I have laid my burdens down And entered into rest Thank you for watching our broadcast this morning. I want to personally invite you to join us for Sunday morning services here on our campus at 300 West Herman Street in downtown Tyler, Texas. Please visit our website to learn more about our church or text NEW to 90382 to receive a personal response from our church staff. If you'd like to make a financial contribution to the church, please use the QR code on the screen for an online giving gift or send a gift to the church at 300 West Roman Street, Tyler, Texas, 75702. Thanks again for joining us. May God bless you.